Keir Starmer has ended his period of summer silence to announce that Labour would freeze energy bills this October. Is the policy worth the wait? I'll be exploring that question with Ash Sarkar. How are you doing, Ash? Oh, mate, it is hella clammy. You know, the weather is just like our political leadership. It's very (laughs) muggy. Very muggy indeed. Although, I mean, not too bad. I think this is probably going to be one of the shows where we're more positive about Keir Starmer than we usually are. I mean, even if there are limits, of course. Um, Do give us your verdict, though. We do want to know what you think. Are you impressed with Keir Starmer's policy to freeze energy bills? We're also going to be talking about the year anniversary of the Taliban taking over in Afghanistan and Jacob Rees-Mogg's hypocrisy on cancel culture. As ever, you can let us know your thoughts on any of those stories on the hashtag Tisky Sour or in the comments. Fresh from his summer holiday, Keir Starmer has announced Labour's plan to deal with spiralling energy costs. He said that if Labour were in government, they would freeze energy prices, in effect cancelling the price rise this October. It would mean energy bills would remain at just below £2,000 instead of rising to the £3,600 currently projected for October and the further rise to £4,200 expected in January. Labour say energy retailers would be compensated for the difference. It's a big offer and unsurprisingly, the first question the BBC put to Starmer this morning was how Labour would pay for it. I'm going to quote yourself at you. Um, No one would pay a penny more on their fuel bill this winter. That is quite a big offer from Labour. How are you going to pay for that? Well, it is a big offer from Labour. We're going to pay for it by extending the windfall tax on oil and gas companies in the North Sea who've made much bigger profits than they expected. But also because our proposal, which is to prevent those energy prices going, uh, increases going forward, will also dampen inflation. And therefore, the money that would otherwise be paid on our debt, because inflation is so high, would not have to be paid. So that's how we'll pay for it. I mean, as you said just a moment ago, millions of families are really struggling to make ends meet, to pay their bills. And the price cap is going to go from just under about £2,000 per household to 3500 in October and then to 4200 in January. And there'll be millions of people watching this who say, I just can't afford that increase. So um, we've got a choice, really, a political choice, which is either we let the oil and gas companies uh, continue to make huge profits um, whilst you know, every family across the country suffers, or we do something about it. And we, the Labour Party, said we're prepared to do something about it. We're on the side of families who are really struggling. And we would have that windfall tax and we would make sure these energy price increases um, do not go ahead in the autumn. So Starmer would cancel the price rise and fund it in part by increasing the windfall tax on energy producers. It's not half bad. And it's miles better than the current offer from our most likely next prime minister in response to the energy price crisis. Truss has said she would cut April's national insurance hike, which would only help poorer households by about 79p a month. And she would also lower corporate taxes. Ash, a Labour finally, finally getting somewhere on the cost of living crisis. Was this worth the wait? Well, look, this is a lot more than they've been offering in recent weeks. Before this, the only two concrete ideas that Starmer's leadership came out with were first to scrap the 5% VAT that you get on domestic energy bills. And then their follow-up policy last week was making sure that prepaid meters were brought in line with direct debit tariffs. Now, for the most part, the prepaid meters are around 2% more expensive. Now, for poor households, that does really have an impact. But when you've got energy bills going up by 54% this year already, clearly that's a drop in the ocean. Now, I've been asking around and you know talking to people in labor circles going, why have things been so shit? Why are you getting outflanked by Ed Davey the leader of the Liberal Democrats on the cost of living crisis. And what came back to me is that they had intended to come out with this very policy that was announced today, which is very, very similar to the Lib Dem one, which keep the energy price cap where it is. And essentially, Keir Starmer was on holiday and got pipped to the post by Ed Davey. So it wasn't necessarily that the Lib Dems bounced Labour into it. It was 
I guess a bit of complacency. Kislam went to Mallorca while Ed Davey stayed on his grind. So this isn't a half bad policy. At least it deals with the fundamental problem that is in front of us, which is that domestic energy bills are going to be unpayable for huge portions of the country come October, even worse in January. And so saying that the price cap stays where it is, that is good, right? That is just straight up good. I know we're going to address the nationalization question a little bit later on, but one thing which is missing uh, from this policy is thinking about what's going on with commercial energy costs. So they're not subject to the same price capping mechanism as domestic energy costs, which means if you run a hairdresser or a cafe, or a small restaurant, your energy bills are going to be going way above what's going on for domestic energy. Now, commercial premises tend to have the same energy needs as the rest of us. You know, it's gas, it's, you know, um, the, the, the same sources as the rest of us. You don't necessarily have like huge amounts of solar, huge amounts of ground source or air source heat pumps. So these are businesses which are really vulnerable. And we're not talking about massive corporations, you know, like Amazon, who'll be able to withstand these kinds of costs. We're talking about small businesses, you know, your local cafe, your local hairdresser, which are going to be really struggling to keep the doors open through the winter. So that is something which is missing from this particular proposal. But at least it's better than the 2%, 5%, you know, tiny, tiny crumbs we've been getting so far. So I heard Rachel Reeves, um, the shadow chancellor, asked today whether this was just Keir Starmer stealing Lib, the Lib Dem policy. She didn't say, oh, it was because Keir Starmer was, was on holiday. She tried to brush aside that issue. But what she did say is that we've, we've costed this. The Lib Dems haven't done that. So let's look at the cost of the plan in a bit more detail and how Labour say it can be paid for. So Labour is saying that stopping the energy price cap being raised for six months is going to cost £29 billion. Labour would hand this huge sum to the energy retailers, the companies that you pay your energy bills to. And it's the difference between the cost of the fuel they're buying on the market and the lower amount they'll be allowed to charge if prices are frozen. In other words, the plan will force the energy retailers to make a loss, which the government will then cover. As to where the money is going to come from, The Guardian reported this. Starmer said the plan would cost £29 billion over the winter and that it would be funded by extending the scope of the windfall tax on energy companies, raising £8 billion, halting the proposed £400 payment for all households offered by the government to compensate for the price cap rise scheduled for October, saving £14 billion, and lowering government interest payments on debt, saving £7 billion, which Labour said would be possible because because its plan would reduce inflation. The profits of the energy giants have been enormous this year, so extending the windfall tax is a no-brainer. Both the Lib Dems and the SNP also suggested it weeks ago. And if the energy cap is frozen, then the £400 payment to all households in October won't be needed. They were intended to offset anticipated rises. Starmer has also pledged to keep Sunak's £650 payment to pensioners and those on universal credit, helping them to cope with the price cap rise we already saw in April. Now, I'll come back to the question of inflation in a moment because there are two big questions that need to be asked about the basics of the plan. First, it only deals with the next six months. But what happens after that? We know that there's another price cap lift due in April next year. If energy prices stay high, wouldn't people just be hit after the six months is up? Here's what Starmer had to say. How long would the price cap last for? Would it go on if prices remain high? Would it go on into next year if bills remain higher next year? How long will that freeze be extended? Yes, yeah, so this plan that we've put forward this morning is a fully costed plan for the six months taking us through the autumn and into the spring of next year. What about obviously, beyond that? Well, beyond that, we'll have to assess the situation. Of course, we will, according to the circumstances as they then are. But the question I think that every political leader needs to answer at the moment is, in relation to that massive hike, I mean, from a cap of £2,000 on bills to 3500 then up again to 4200 in January, which is going to make it a really difficult winter for millions of people. Um, what are you going to do about it? And that's the question we're answering today. 
I accept that um, in the medium and long term, there have got to be other measures, which is why um, we've argued for some time that in addition to this package, we need to insulate millions of homes that are leaking um, heat and energy all of the time. We said that a year ago now, um, but the government's done nothing about it. But I, I think the question that you know, everybody is really anxious about because um, everybody, I think, now knows that in October their energy bills are going to go through the roof again and then January even further is what are you going to do about it? And the Labour Party says, we're on your side. We will tax the oil and gas companies that have made more money than they were expecting uh, and use that money to freeze these prices to make sure there aren't uh, those um, increases in the autumn. So what we've been told is that the reason for the increase in energy costs is the war in Ukraine. So that means there's a chance that energy costs will come down if the conflict is resolved in six months. But at the moment, that doesn't look likely. What the war has shown anyway is how vulnerable our energy supply is to world events, and a better plan would deal with that issue. Which brings me to the second question. If you're subsidising the energy retailers to the tune of £29 billion over six months, why not bring them into common ownership? Here's Starmer's view. And if the energy companies can't provide energy that people can afford, should they be nationalised? Well, uh, uh, the choice we've made in our plan is that every single penny uh, that is needed for this plan will go directly to reducing the bills of families up and down the country. If you go down the nationalisation route, then um, money has to be spent on compensating shareholders. And I think in, a, in an emergency uh, like this, a national emergency where people are struggling to pay their bills, I think that the right choice is for every single penny to go to reducing those bills, which is why we've gone for this across the board, freeze the prices, um, use that uh, or, or raise the money for that through the oil and gas companies who've made more profit than they're expecting. Now, Keith Summer is correct. Nationalisation would normally, to some degree, subsidise shareholders. But the £29 billion of Starmer's plan would be subsidising shareholders anyway, with nothing in return for British taxpayers. And the gravy train that is our energy market would continue. Commonwealth have reported that the main energy retailers have paid £23 billion to shareholders in the last 10 years, most of which are large overseas investors. Can we afford 10 more years of that? The size of Starmer's plan also makes nationalisation seem relatively inexpensive. And in July, the TUC published a report stating this. The TUC has conducted analysis on the likely cost of compensation to government from nationalising the retail divisions of the big five energy retailers. This analysis shows a high-end maximum estimate for taking the big five retail companies with over 70% of household customers into public ownership as costing £2.75 to £2.85 billion. This is an equivalent sum to the £2.7 billion that the National Audit Office estimated that energy customers would need to pay to cover the costs of the 28 energy suppliers that failed since June 2021. So, according to the TUC, nationalisation would only cost the amount the public have been forced to bail out the private energy sector alone. That's it, in a single year. Now, it seems to me Starmer has two options here. He can spend £29 billion to subsidise fuel bills within our current defunct system, or spend the £29 billion to subsidise fuel bills and then add an extra £2.7 billion to set up a sustainable energy system for the long term. That price difference isn't, isn't particularly big. You can go for the short term one or the only slightly more expensive long term one. Ash, why has Starmer avoided that latter option? Basically, the reason why Keir Starmer isn't pledging nationalisation, even though it financially makes more sense than chucking £29 billion down the black hole of a privatised industry, is because he's pandering to an ideological position which holds that the state should never try and uh, administer the things that we all need to survive. Because this is the bedrock of the neoliberal consensus, the idea that the state is fundamentally incompetent and inefficient. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the past 40 years, particularly with rail and with energy and with water, is that these are all utilities which are really badly run by the private sector. You've got up to a fifth of water being leaked by private companies in England. You only have to look at Avanti West Coast to look at the mess the private sector has made of the railways. And because we have given up so much of our energy sovereignty, 
first and foremost because we rely on imported gas, but also secondarily because control over the sector has been ceded to the markets, has been ceded to big overseas investors. We are unable to control prices the way other countries are able to. And we've also been really slow to transition away from imported fossil fuels onto the kind of domestic renewable energy like solar, like offshore and onshore wind, like hydroelectricity, which would also prepare us for a decarbonized future and a sustainable economy. Now, anyone who is anti-nationalization will say that they are motivated by pragmatism rather than ideology. And one of the things I was saying earlier is that if you wanted to have a peek into the kind of mindset that Keir Starmer is trying to appeal to at the moment, you should go and look at Dan Hodges' Twitter, because he has been somewhat radicalized on the issue of nationalization. He sort of feels that it's inevitable that uh, parts of the energy sector and the water sector will be taken into national ownership. When he was then confronted by other Twitter users saying, hang on, you were really anti-Corbyn when he suggested the same thing, he went, ah, 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 Corbyn was motivated by principle and not by pragmatism. Now, this distinction between principle and pragmatism is entirely subjective. I think of my politics as being pragmatic. I think of the sort of politics being pushed by Liz Truss are deeply ideological. That is not an objective measurement of whether a particular policy is going to be good or not based on what you think the intention is because you're obviously a telepath. Um, you know, it's a really silly kind of way to limit the scope of your political vision. Now, unfortunately, because Keir Starmer isn't actually that good at politics, that is precisely the kind of limitation that he accepts for himself, which is why, despite promising that Labour would be responsible with taxpayer money, he would rather spend £29 billion on keeping the price gap where it is for six months, rather than spending £2.85 billion, which is a hell of a lot smaller, on bringing the energy sector into public ownership, which means that the state has a lot more control over setting energy prices. And the state could also manage a transition to renewable sources of energy, which would insulate us from the kinds of price shocks that we're experiencing right now and also, you know, won't boil the planet to death. Mm. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I know you know this, but I mean, it would, it wouldn't be, I don't think it's the 2.7 as opposed to the 29 billion, because even if you know, you'd, you'd the phase it would be you'd nationalize them and then you'd have to cover the difference between the the price cap and the wholesale prices so the the nationalized industry would still have to make a loss for quite a while but the idea would be that in the long run in the future we would get into a situation whereby we didn't have to subsidize the difference between international markets and what we want to charge consumers because we'd actually have thought about this in advance like the french have done right so we've got this huge crisis of gas bills and oil bills going up the government saying this has nothing to do with us well, the French are saying, well, actually, we invested in nuclear, um, so we can afford to subsidize any difference there is, and they're only having price rises of 4%. So people say, it's incredibly expensive what Labour are doing. They're still accepting the price rise from back in April. The French have managed to cancel that. Well, I mean, they have a completely different system, but they've managed to go from 4% from, from last year. So much more ambitious, and they've been able to do that because um, they have a nationalized oil sector and they've invested in alternatives to gas and oil. Now, another claim that's been made by the Labour Party is that their plan will help to deal with inflation. Starmer has said that freezing the energy cap rise would stop inflation from rising as much as predicted in the coming months, and that in turn would reduce the rate of interest Britain pays on its debt. A £7 billion saving that would go towards the £29 billion cost of the plan. But director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Paul Johnson, wasn't so sure. He said that since the plan is only for the next six months, overall rises in inflation will only be deferred. The BBC put this point to Keir Starmer. I want to draw your attention to the front page of the Tele Daily Telegraph today. Um, quotes from Paul Johnson, director of the Institute for Fiscal yeah. Studies, who says in the Telegraph, um, they're warning that £7.2 billion saving on interest payments on national debt is actually, this is what, what you're proposing, an illusion. Inflation will increase unless the huge subsidies remain permanent beyond the six months. It's an illusion in the sense that it will reduce interest debt payments in the short term, but unless you maintain these subsidi subsidies yeah. permanently, you won't reduce them in the long run. Inflation will be higher later on. That's from the director of the IFS. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, and um, what Paul Johnson isn't disputing is that our plan will reduce inflation. So he's absolutely clear that that is the case. Of course, what he's rightly saying is 
um, what happens after April matters because you have to maintain measures to reduce inflation. Of course, um, we have to do that in April when we see the circumstances. But what he's not suggesting is that we're wrong when we say that our plan will reduce inflation and therefore the huge payments we make uh, on our debt because of rising inflation. So, yes, it's true that in April and towards the latter end of next year, all of us will again be asked to say, well, what are you going to do now? And that's why what I'm saying about the medium and long term today is really important. But nobody, including Paul Johnson, is arguing with the fact that Labour's plan will not only keep energy prices down for millions of families this winter, but also um, keep inflation down, which um, is so important in terms of the drivers of, of price increases across the country. So again, it looks like Labour is betting that the situation will look very different in six months' time. But Starmer isn't telling us what it would do if or what Labour would do if things haven't changed. But there are alternatives. One proposal I've seen comes from campaign group We Own It. They point out that Norway imposes a permanent windfall tax on the fuel they extract from the North Sea at a rate of 56%. That contrasts with extractors like BP and Shell, who have in some years paid zero tax to the UK on their profits from our North Sea fuel. Norway's system has funded a $1.4 trillion sovereign wealth fund, which pays 80% of people's bills above a capped price. We in Britain are left with virtually nothing. Actually, I suppose, you know, somewhat aside from this policy from, from the Labour Party, in general, you know, Norway, they have access to North Sea oil. What they decided to do was tax this at a really high level. They have a sovereign wealth fund. It gives them loads of room for manoeuvre in situations like this. They have money to spare so they can subsidise their consumers. In Britain, we also had loads of access to the North Sea. Thatcher wasted all that money essentially um, to cut taxes. And now the moment energy prices go up and people are in a tough spot, we don't really have any money to spare. Well, I mean, I think we can borrow, but we, we, can't, we don't have money that we can comfortably use in the way that the Norwegians can. And it just leads to the question, why can't British people have nice things? I mean, Michael, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's fucking neoliberalism, mate. That's why. I mean, that is a sort of sliding doors moment that you point to in the 1980s with the discovery of North Sea oil. And you've got one Gwyneth Paltrow, who is the Norwegian government, going, you know what, we're going to tax this at a really high rate and have a sovereign wealth fund. And so you have a well-funded welfare state. You've got Scandinavian-style social democracy, which lots of people, of course, look up to. And then you've got like evil Gwyneth Paltrow, which is Margaret Thatcher going, you know what this is going to be fucking great for? Corporations and establishing a form of rentier capitalism, which means that forever the public are in a hock to this kind of unaccountable capitalist class to access the things that they need to survive. And unfortunately, you know, we we had the evil Gwyneth Paltrow, Michael. That was Margaret Thatcher. But then even after that, when you had, you know, historic Labour landslides in the form of a Tony Blair government, what you had were wasted opportunity piled onto wasted opportunity. You didn't see a massive increase in, for instance, council house building, which would have been something which helped shift the balance of power from the rich in favour of the poor. It would have dealt with this scourge of landlordism, which I know gives you, uh, you know, so many conniptions on a day-to-day -day basis, Michael. Uh, you know, you had New Labour going, we are not going to tinker with the fundamentals that Thatcher laid down for how you manage an economy. What we're going to do is a little bit of light redistribution partner with the private sector so that we're not using the state to borrow to invest a huge amount. And what we've ended up with is a slower demise of the private sector rather than a total renewal of it that you might have seen with a Labour leader more in the style of Clement Attlee. Then what happens after the financial crisis? You get the coalition government and conservative governments. Now, of course, growth was a lot more sluggish during that period, but it was year-on-year -year growth following the financial crisis. And it was also record low interest rates. So that would have been a really good time to borrow to invest in British society, borrow to invest in decarbonizing the economy, borrow to invest in council housing, borrow to invest retrofitting. These are all things that could have been done during that time. But again, it wasn't done because of ideological reasons. Now, that golden window has closed. Right, that era of low interest rates 
is uh, we're not seeing the kind of stable governance, which means that you can have that kind of, you know, huge reorientation of the economy and what it's there for the way that Thatcher was able to and the way that Blair had the opportunity to, to do but declined to take on. Now what we have is a level of political volatility which has become a new normal, the idea that we don't have stable government, we don't have a government that we can rely on. Two, we will no longer have those lovely low interest rates. And three, what are we what amazing resource are we going to be able to divert profits from in order to fund a massive welfare state? Yes, we do have fossil fuels and yes, those fossil fuels aren't nearly taxed enough. And yes, oil and gas giants as a whole aren't taxed enough. But there's a reason why Norway has over a trillion dollars in its sovereign wealth fund and we've got absolutely fucking nothing. It's because of our political leadership and because of the ideology that they've been yoked to for about 40 years now. That's the ideology that it does seem that Keir Starmer is not particularly willing to stray from. And I suppose that's what's you know, disappointing about making this argument against nationalisation while he's making what I think is a decent policy, which is to, to spend some money in the short term to cap these energy bills. Because it's not just, you know, the defence that's made of a position like that is to say, look, they're in opposition. This isn't actually a policy that's going to get implemented. What this is about is positioning themselves so they have the initiative. And I actually do think this policy has done that. I don't think the Tories are going to cap um, energy costs. And even if they did, it, it, it's a big and memorable thing that Labour have offered. So I think people will recognise that no, Labour offered that first. So I think it's electorally probably smart. It's not just that they haven't adopted a policy of nationalisation, but by not adopting it, Keir Starmer then has to go on the telly and argue that nationalisation is a bad thing. Because... That's the only way to make sense of him not including it in the policy platform. So then you have a Labour leader who is saying like, oh, no, no, nationalisation would be too expensive. And when you say nationalisation would be too expensive, what you're doing is you are feeding into that lie that investing in assets is something which irresponsible governments would do when the precise opposite is the case. You know, what the rich people do, they're constantly investing in assets. They're investing in assets because that's what people do with money if they want to be rich in the long term. But when it comes to the government, you say, oh, don't invest in assets. That's that, that's going to cost us loads of money. If you, have you ever heard a rich person say, "Don't invest in assets; it's too expensive"? No, because it's crazy, right? So, so I do think Gisdarva could be going up there and making that argument, and then we would be in a much better position if Labour were to get into government, or even if they lose, because people would know the truth instead of having some lie repeated to them. It's been exactly a year since the Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan following the withdrawal of American troops. The speed of the collapse of the US-backed government showed the limits of military regime change and Western attempts at nation building. But there were plenty of unknowns about how a second period of Taliban rule would look for Afghanistan's people. There had been hopes that the Taliban had matured in the 20 years since they were last in power. For example, their officials had said that women's rights would be respected and girls would be allowed in school. Yet, 12 months on, secondary school age girls remain locked out of an education. Another unknown was how the Taliban would integrate and be integrated into the international system. Would a humbled West now accept the Taliban as the recognised government of Afghanistan and interact with them accordingly? Well, on that front, the news is also not good. The United States responded to the Taliban takeover by imposing sanctions on the country and freezing the assets of Afghanistan's central bank. That asset freeze is still in place, and as a result, Afghanistan's economy has almost entirely collapsed. Hospitals can't pay doctors and nurses, schools can't pay teachers, and 95% of the Afghan population suffer from a lack of food to eat. A group of 32 NGOs, including the International Rescue Committee, have, in response, called for the West to begin unfreezing those assets. To find out more about 12 months of Taliban rule, I spoke to Obadullah Bahir, a lecturer at the American University of Afghanistan. I began by asking him in what way the Taliban have conformed to or confounded prior expectations. I think one of the issues we've always had with the Taliban, even the first time they came to power in the 90s, was that they're always coming in with uh, so much hype that people think that they've evolved, that they're very sophisticated. And the way that they conducted the war made us actually believe that they were a sophisticated group that understand how Psy, understood how PSYOPs worked, how international engagement worked, because the way they maneuvered themselves after the Doha deal to impose themselves on the whole region um, 
But that hasn't been the same. They've been a very irrational, incohesive group. Um, and they've, in many ways, they've been the same uh, as the first time around in the 90s, uh, the way that they're engaging with the West and asking for international recognition without meeting any criteria is the same as they were in the 90s. The way that they're taking away civil liberties is the same as they were in the 90s. The way they're intolerant towards dissent is the way that they were in the 90s. But I think the only thing that they're different um, with regards to is uh, that there are people amongst them that understand the utility of international engagement. Maybe that was the case in the 90s as well, but I think this time the proportion is larger. And uh, it's just that we have to figure out whether they can get their house in order and the old guard that still has the very old vision of an old Afghanistan that they want to rule. Um, we'll have to see if these, this larger, weaker majority can uh, eventually start calling the shots or else this will be a very short-lived regime. So that's interesting. So you do see lots of division within the Taliban leadership. So let's take, I suppose, the policy which probably has had the most publicity in the West, very understandably, which is secondary school girls have been banned um, from going to school. Do you think that's a policy that's going to last or, or, or are there real divisions within the Taliban on, on that question? Oh, one thing the Taliban have been really good at is keeping uh, their differences at bay. So they don't really let it out. They don't really show you so much so as the Dawahiri bombing in uh, Kabul, the drone strike that killed Al-Qaeda's leader, uh, even though there was one group amongst the Taliban that was complicit or directly involved in hosting them, uh, you really didn't hear much from the Taliban where there was some blame within the group uh, delegated. So they really keep it in-house. Uh, but that being said, they're with regards to the girls' schools issue, Taliban have actually come out and been very vocal about the right for girls to get educated. We've sat a, a, a across delegations from the Taliban where they've said that the majority of the Taliban already agree that girls should go back to school. And uh, I think there are just four or five really important uh, people within the cabinet and then the Amir, which is their head of state himself, who don't seem to be in favor of girls really uh, going to high school or women participating in public life. Um, and that's where the tension is. So we'll have to see in this tug of war amongst them as to who wins. Or maybe it could just be a political game where they're using this as a political bargaining chip with the international community, seeing what they can get in return for it. But if that's the case, then it'll be a horrible message to give to the Afghan population, especially the Afghan women and girls, that they, they were just part of a larger game that the Taliban were trying to play. Uh, let's talk about that question of relationships with the international community. So assets were frozen from the Afghan Central Bank. The economy has essentially collapsed. We've got NGOs sort of saying you, you need to start unfreezing these assets because of the humanitarian consequences it's causing. At the same time, you seem to be suggesting that potentially some reforms could be won, including you know, very consequential ones about girls going to school. If, if the international community or the West, in this case, really plays its cards right, I mean, where, where do you stand on that question? I think one thing that was a uh, horrible news uh, compounding the August 15th trauma that this nation was dealing with was the fact that the United States announced suspension of engagement with the Taliban and having in zero intent to talk about the federal assets release uh, any time in the future over the Al-Qaeda issue and the hosting of them in Kabul. And I think that's that's horrible for Afghanistan. I mean, yes, the Taliban should not have hosted uh, Al-Qaeda members in Kabul, but I think just the form of this punishment and prolonging of it at a time where Afghanistan is facing the worst humanitarian crisis ever is problematic. I'm of the opinion that there has to be engagement because the Taliban are here and the Taliban are here because the international community signed deals with them, right? Um, not the Afghans. So the Afghans have always been the victim in this equation before and after. Um, so rather than choosing to bury your heads in the sand and ignoring Afghanistan and hoping that it's a problem that eventually goes away itself, I think the it is it is a moral uh, requirement uh, on the international community to turn around and try to make something out of this reality. They have leverages, the Taliban have shown desire and intent to cash in and acquire those uh, leverages. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't have to be complete recognition, but we can be micro ambitious and set goals, reestablish trust between the international community and the Taliban. So we start heading somewhere and we get out of this stalemate that has existed for almost a year now. That was Abu Dhabi here speaking to me earlier today. The Tories have positioned themselves as the last champions of free speech. They've condemned everyone from universities to the BBC for engaging in cancel culture, insisting instead that people should be allowed to speak in those spaces no matter what their views. And no Tory has made his views on this topic better known than Brexit Opportunities Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg. Here he is stating his views in the Commons. Freedom of speech is fundamental to how our society operates. Democracy, the rule of law, freedom of speech and the rights of property are the four pillars on which our constitution is built and a constitution that has thrived through the centuries. If you take away freedom of speech, then you undermine all the other pillars that have supported our constitution. It is a requirement in state-funded schools uh, to teach a broad and balanced curriculum that promotes the spiritual, moral, cultural, mental and physical development of pupils at schools. And this must be done in a way that encourages freedom of speech. And the key to that is that we all have to accept the right of people to express views that not only that we don't like, but on occasions we even find offensive. If we only accept views that we like and find unchallenging, then there is no freedom of speech. So, we all have to accept the right of people to say things that we don't like, and even to say things that we find offensive. Otherwise, I guess we're free speech hating snowflakes. Imagine my surprise then when I read in The Telegraph, my newspaper of choice, Jacob Rees-Mogg tells civil servants to trawl social media to weed out extremist guests. And the subclause, new cabinet office rules also urge ministers to check the profiles of visitors taking part in learning and development events. The Telegraph goes on to say, new cabinet office rules introduced last week also urge managers to carefully check the profiles of visitors taking part in learning and development events, including for criticisms of government policy. The new vetting process involves looking at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn posts from the past three to five years to find potentially problematic or controversial material that may contravene civil service values. Five years! So suddenly people who once criticised the government half a decade ago are dangerous extremists who can't be allowed near civil servants. And the Telegraph give some examples. Priya Gopal is Professor of Postcolonial Studies at Cambridge University. As a world-renowned expert on colonialism and its history, you'd think she'd be considered an expert rather than an extremist. But no, in October she was disinvited from giving a speech to civil servants at the Home Office because she criticised Priti Patel over her racist immigration policies. Gopal had tweeted this. Priti Patel is also a reminder that many Asians in British Africa had ferociously anti-black attitudes and were used by colonial administrations to keep black populations in their place, an attitude she brings to government. Now, I potentially wouldn't have tweeted that, but this is someone who is of South Asian heritage. And the whole point Reese Mogg was making is that even if you are offended by this, that shouldn't matter. She has the right to offend you. Next is Afawa Hirsch. Um, she is a writer and broadcaster. Um, she was also invited to speak to civil servants at an undisclosed government department in 2021, but it never happened. The Times reports on this one. They say, Hirsch said she was dropped at short notice earlier this year by a government department for, quote, having a piece in the New York Times about racism in Britain, which it felt painted Britain in a bad light. She had written that there was a deep correlation between race and privilege in Britain. So, quote, the relatively few people of colour and even fewer if you count only those who have African heritage who rise to prominent success and prosperity in Britain are often told we should be grateful or told to leave if we don't like it here. That's what she stated. Hirsch has accused the Prime Minister of a, quote, a litany of racist statements. So apparently telling the truth is now extremism in Tory land. Ash, um, I mean, we talk about Jacob Rees-Mogg hypocrisy quite a lot, but him standing up in Parliament saying the right to be offended is an absolute one. And now you can't speak to the civil service if you've just criticised the government. Well, no, I think the thing that you don't understand, Michael, is that actually being a member of the government means that you've got a protected characteristic. The M in BAME <laughs> stands for minister. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> 
I will never stop making that joke. Um, I mean, look, taking this argument on its own terms at face value, which is to say this really is about freedom of speech, you can see the contradictions and the absurdity because we've ended up in a really weird position where we think the right to freedom of speech really only applies to what could be deemed acts of hate speech, whether that's transphobia or your right to call the corner shop a packy shop or something like that. That's what we define as contentious but lawful and should be free speech. And yet when we think about free speech as it was actually first formulated by 18th and 19th century political philosophers, free speech in order to criticize a state, because that's, of course, what the First Amendment right is intended to do. It's a bulwark against tyranny. That is something that we're more than happy to throw out of the window. And to think about how this happened, I think, is really important, because I think that one of the things that the conservatives have understood is that you can weaponize a kind of resentment at the journey towards social equality that minorities in this country have taken. This idea of, hang on, the language that I once used 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago is no longer acceptable. You can weaponize that kind of resentment and discomfort and say, this is because fundamentally your rights are under attack and we are the only ones who are going to protect you. So it's not really about freedom of speech at all. It's about freedom and power to get other people to shut up and stop making you uncomfortable. So really, this isn't a form of hypocrisy or a double standard at all. This is a single standard. It's a way of making sure only a few people are able to define what speech is and retaining the ability to clamp down on forms of political expression, which threaten the powers that be in this country. So not hypocrisy, not a double standard, just the one standard. And it's a cynical one. I think that's very well put. Um, if you're enjoying what you're watching, and Ash's brilliant last point, do like the video. It helps us on the algorithm. Before we go, I want to show you one example of the amazing cognitive dissonance that infects the right. On Friday, author Salman Rushdie was stabbed in New York. It was a terrible crime, and Rushdie is likely to suffer life-changing injuries. Some have concluded the attacker was trying to carry out the fatwa of Iran's former supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, who died 33 years ago. The fatwa was called after the publication of Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, which was deemed offensively critical of Islam. Now, in response to the appalling attack, Guido Fawkes tweeted this. Um, so it's a picture of Salman Rushdie with the quote, what is freedom of expression without the freedom to offend? It ceases to exist. Understandable thing to tweet in that context. But then the very next thing they tweeted, the very next one, was this comment on the new resmog policy. Um, so there was a, a, a tweet from a journalist explaining um, that the government are being told to look back five years before someone is allowed to five years of their social media content before they're allowed to speak to the civil service. And Guido Fawkes says, good to see another long advocated Guido policy initiative being implemented. Now, of course, we should say being disinvited to speak to the civil service is very, very different being stabbed in the neck because someone didn't like a book you wrote. But still, I mean, I think Guido Fawkes, if there is anyone in public life who is more hypocritical on their own terms. I kind of agree with you, Ash, that you know it's not hypocritical if you're talking about what they really mean, which is you can't criticize the powerful. But on their own terms, which is to say freedom of speech is absolute, it's important, you should be allowed to offend people unless you've said something that offends me, which seems to be where Guido are coming from, doesn't it, Ash? Well, absolutely. And if you want to maybe make a much more direct comparison, let's say, for instance, a university had invited Priti Patel to address the students and the students uh, lodged a protest and said, we don't want her to come and address us. I'm sure that Guido Fawkes would come down on a very, very different side on whether or not disinviting somebody because of the politics that they hold does or does not constitute a threat to freedom of speech. So I think that it, we don't have to even try and compare the violent assault on Salman Rushdie to their 
view of civil servants who might hold challengingly progressive views. You just have to look at how the folks at Guido Fawkes have responded to university campus culture kind of moral outrages. Um, I think that, again, the Salman Rushdie thing, what that points to is that there are various ways in which we can understand what happened. One way, and this is one way which is particularly favoured by the media establishment in this country, is to say that, well, this shows you just how uniquely uniquely barbarous Islam is. Now, most Muslims are like me. They're just horrified that this thing has happened. Of course, Salman Rushdie was also raised in a Muslim household. This is an attack essentially on, on one of our own. There is no way that you can think that this is justifiable if you have any sort of value for human life. There's another way in which you can look at this, which is the fatwa is is an edict which is issued by a state. It's a way in which a state using religion is able to say this person doesn't have a right to live. Now, obviously, there is nothing quite as extreme as that uh, in a Western context, but there are plenty of instances where Western states set people up and go, you, either as an individual or you as a demographic, you're public enemy number one. And it creates a context in which harm is much more likely to come to them. And so I think that this is a really important context in which to understand the attack on Salman Rushdie, is that it was a form of state brutality, where the state is able to create an environment in which acts of violence are more likely and a way in which the state uses that capacity to mobilize the violence of others in order to clamp down on free expression. And so then when you see it as a form of state power, in this instance, Iranian state power, you would then be a lot less casual about the British state determining the boundaries of free speech and determining that criticism of the government is an unacceptable form of free speech. No, I think that was very difficult to, to disagree with, Ash, very well put. Um, let's wrap up there, actually. Um, Ash, it's been a pleasure being joined by you this Monday. Thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me sweat all over this camera. I'm going to go downstairs and sit in front of a fan. Ooh, tell me about it. I think this is the last really hot show we're going to have in a while. Um, maybe I'm speaking too soon. We'll be back on Wednesday. For now, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night. <laughs>